Hello and welcome to the Candid Cash Flow Podcast, episode 53. I'm your host, Ava Fails. Welcome, welcome, Cash Flow Nation, to this very special season one wrap up of the Candid Cash Flow podcast. We are finally to the last episode of 2018. When we speak again, a new year will have dawned. I hope all. All the best for you in 2019. Joining me today is Dale L. Roberts, the quintessential knowledge base in all things self-publishing. I've been working with Dale for almost two years now, and he's not only my client, but he's also my good friend. In the past few years, Dale has built one of the most stellar online communities that I've ever had the privilege to be a part of. This guy really made me see that birds of a feather collect together. Good people draw in other good people. And what you end up with is an unstoppable group of people doing big things and helping each other. One of my favorite things about Dell is that he really goes out of his way to highlight people in his community and make everyone feel equally important. He is accessible to his community and has formed many genuine friendships with the members therein. The community a person is able to build really says a lot about the character and integrity of that person. Sure, Dale draws a great crowd of people, but the reason behind that is also important. I would be hard-pressed to find anyone online or off who knows more about the self-publishing industry than Dale. He has made it his business to be in the know. When changes happen, he usually knows first and is informing his audience before anyone else. I would venture to say that there are others in the industry who look to Dale to get the breaking news for their own communities. At the foundation of all that community and knowledge is a guy who is in the game because he genuinely wants to help people and is passionate about books. I am thankful every day that God brought Dell into my life, and I'm honored to present this interview when I sat down with Dell to talk self-publishing, wrestling, resources, and what's coming in 2019. I have to preface this episode with an explanation of the inside joke that kind of permeates the entire interview. When I did my first cut of Dell's intro, I called him Dan. I had been on a quick store run and realized standing in the checkout line that I was 15 minutes from this call. Needless to say, I was a bit rushed, and that, coupled with live calls residing outside of my comfort zone, I was a bit tongue-tied. I've talked to Dell countless times, and we communicate multiple times on a weekly basis, so this was a bit embarrassing. I just wanted to make sure you were all in on the inside joke, but before we jump in, a quick word from our sponsor. So you've written your book. Now what? Head over to Publish Drive and create your free account. Publish Drive is an aggregate publishing platform with distribution to all the major booksellers, including iBooks, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, and Google Play Books. You're just a few clicks away from the title Published Author. Check it out today at heyoava.com slash publish drive. I'd like to welcome the fabulous Dale L. Roberts to the Candid Cash Flow podcast today for a sit down. Thanks for coming. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate you getting the name right. Uh, not uh, only <laughs> calling me Dale, but also adding in the L. Believe it or not, a lot of people forget to add the L in. And see, the thing is, you have to have that differentiator because otherwise, if you search up Dale Roberts, you're going to find a deceased footballer and, and or a mystery writer. And I'm neither one of those because I can tell you I'm alive and well. And also, (laughs) I cannot write a mystery to save my life. (laughs) We need to go steal that that guy's traffic. (laughs) You're right. Right. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I'm just going to jump right in. What did you do before you became the, not a, the self-publishing expert? Oh, well, thanks. I I appreciate the expert. And it's not 
necessarily a title that I have willingly taken. Um, but thank you for not calling me a guru. That's typically where I feel like I want to just punch myself in the mouth. I, I, I am a person that loves the business of self-publishing, of being an indie author in an indie author community. And the, the reason is uh, I've had this lifelong dream of being an author, of becoming an author. And I even went to college, believe it or not. I don't know if I've ever shared this one with you that I went to college to become a writer. I actually had a major in journalism and a minor in English. However, I made it about a year and a half into college life before I decided that I didn't need college. I, I, it was an ego thing. Uh, long story short, I just kind of walked away from it and life got in the way. And I just walked away from wanting to be an author. You fast forward some time later this was in 2014 that I published, self-published my first book. And I, in my head, I thought, well, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be great. I made 20 some dollars my first month of the business and I quit my day job. Not lying. 30 day notice, put it in. This was a great job, but I walked away from it because I believe, well, if I put just this little bit of attention into this business, what if I put a lot of bit of attention into this business? <laughs> and, you know, uh, thankfully I had a little bit of a nest egg put aside. I had a 401k that I, I peeled through and also paid taxes for out the rear end the very next year. And my wife also was running a, uh, an FBA business through Amazon. So a lot of that was covering our expenses because fun fact, we were eating nothing but ramen noodles and frozen veggies for about a year there because I wasn't making jack squat. In fact, a couple of years into the business really wasn't worth anything. It sucked. But in my heart, I almost felt like if I can just start to understand this business of being an indie author, of being a self-publisher, I could be able to see that success that I would see in other videos of these, these guys that would be on these gurus, these self-publishing gurus, YouTube channels that were like making nine grand per month, their first 30 <laughs> days in the business, or, or they're doing $15,000. And in my mind, I was like, you know what? That's great. That's awesome. If I can just have a consistent payout that matches the amount of income that I was doing in my nine to five job, I was going to be happy. I was going to be content. So that's when I started investing in courses. I invested in a coach. I invested all of my waking hours. And sometimes that was 20 hours out of the day to where I was reading on it. I was watching videos. I was asking questions. I was literally trying to just learn as much as I could because I wanted to get to that point to where self-publishing could sufficiently pay the bills and give me a little bit extra money at the end of the day that I can enjoy a nice life with my wife. And yes, folks, you can laugh at me, my cat. Yep, yeah. my wife and my cat. That's what really what my purpose is, is I want to be unencumbered by a nine to five job. I'm just yeah. not an em I, I, I'm a model employee. You can go back and look at my resume. People loved working with me. That's because that's how I am. However, it doesn't fulfill me like what this business does because I get to, first of all, A, be my own boss and yeah. B, creatively express myself because I am a creative individual. I like to paint outside the lines. I like to express myself in a way that shows who I am and also one of the biggest things that fulfills me most is helping other people. Yeah. And that's where we come full circle into why self-publishing expert, why self-publishing coach. It's because I love to see people succeed. Yeah. And I've worked with people, everything, everyone from, and of course I'm preaching to the choir because you know, uh, but I have, I've worked with people that carry a nine to five job and just want to have a side hustle where they're like, Hey, yeah. I want to write a book on such and such. And I help them fulfill that. Or there's those people that want to get out of their nine to five job and they look at self publishing as the avenue to do it within. 
And so I like doing that. One of my greatest highs is helping people achieve a lifelong dream. And this actually even goes back and this, I can even cite this back to working 20 years in the healthcare industry as an activities director. And one of the awesomest things, and this, this, I got goosebumps on my arms just thinking about this. It was so cool that I would have say an 80 year old or a 90 year old, or sometimes even a hundred year old that would say to me, I've never done that before. That was so awesome. And when I could be able to get it to where someone says, I've never done that before, or they say, that was great. That was so awesome. That to me, that's a high. Like it's, there's no drug better than that. And trust me, I've, I've had my fair share of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not endorsing it here, folks. You know, I, I, trust me, everybody's been in college, so they know where I'm going with that. But, you know, nonetheless, that's why. That's yeah. why I get into this. And I like to take a lot of this and, I'm, I'm a curator of information. That's the best way to put it. You can't call me a self-publishing curator. People are going to be like, what? Is, is he like Indiana Jones of self-publishing? Well, yeah, I guess you can kind of think of that. Except probably not as ruggedly handsome, nor the awesome ability to put on a cap like that and look freaking amazing. You know, um, I like to curate information. I like to figure out what is fact and what is fiction. I yeah. want to break things, make mistakes, and then hopefully figure out what is the best path that's going to get the success. And then from there, I share those findings as I go along. Okay, this is how I messed up. This is how I did it better. This is how you could possibly do it better. There you go. So um, that's a long story. Look, we're all done with the podcast, folks. Thank you very much for showing up. (laughs) Right. right. Well, I, you know, I think, um, you know, I like to avoid that whole guru uh, persona just as much as you do as far as that goes. But I think to be an effective expert, you really have to be tried in the fire of, you know, ramen noodles and veggies for a year. You know, that kind of stuff. I don't think... Uh, I think that adds a lot, especially when you get into where you're helping others. You have a story to share and to tell that's relatable. And as soon as you're building those relationships, things start to explode, you know? Yeah, it helps me out because I'm able to not just sympathize, but also empathize with people as they're going along in their own individual journeys. You know, um, I I have on at least a semi-daily basis that someone reaches out to me in a position of desperation, be it they need to pay their bills or be it that they're sick of their job. Um, Either way, I I like to empathize with those folks and I like to see where they're, they're coming from because here's the thing is I've ran into a number of these would be experts, these people that would disguise themselves as experts and put these lavish you know expectations of what they're delivering as far as services yeah. and, and, and courses and information and when i would reach out to them it was almost like a let down you know never meet your heroes because you know they might turn you know turn out to be something you never wanted to see well that was what i wanted to be the antithesis of right. is i want to get it to where i'm not this guru i'm not this higher you know, bigger than life person. There's a good reason why I wear a t-shirt and jeans in every single one of my videos. Yeah. It's because that's who I am. I am not going to go put on a sport jacket because guess what? First of all, there's ne- never any sport jackets for my long orangutan arms. And the next thing <laughs> is I never feel comfortable in it and it's not me. Right. So hopefully, you know, that's where people can kind of see where I'm coming from. And like I said, I can be able to empathize with a lot of people where they're coming from and hopefully provide a solution yeah. to what they're looking for. So was it there some wrestling mixed in there somewhere? You know, it was so funny. Uh, yes, uh, it's this is always a, an unlikely story. The the wrestling almost always comes up as the unlikely story. But believe it or not, I've worn many hats in my forty two years on this earth. So the wrestling one, for some reason, it stops traffic. And I actually had started it in two thousand and two, uh, and it was through my love of pro wrestling as an adult, not as a child, as a child, I was told it was the F word. It was fake, right. you know? And I'm like, yeah, so I just blew it off. It wasn't until August, 
the 13th of 1999. That's right. More recently, I actually tracked down the very day I fell in love with a larger than life sport that also, you know, I was told, hey, this is fake stuff, but I fell in love with it. And I fell in love with another thing indirectly because of me falling in love with pro wrestling. You ready for this? Health and fitness. When I saw these larger than life guys that are just jacked to the gills and we can talk about how they got to that point, but that's besides the point to me, my perception was, oh my gosh, these guys ate well, they, they dieted, they hit the gym. So I became obsessed like I usually do with everything. And I got into really great shape. In fact, my friend Makai was just in town and visiting with me more recently. And he was like, man, you remember that? That year, you blew up like in three months. He was like, it was incredible. You were like 150 pounds, and all of a sudden, you were 200 pounds. And I was like, well, first of all, I had something working in my favor. I was in my 20s. There's no way I'd be able to do that now. But nonetheless, I got in really great shape, and I fell in love with it. Now, see, here is where it gets very interesting. And a lot of people, you can put the F word on wrestling, a.k.a. sports entertainment, the thing is, what people fail to notice about professional wrestling is it's storytelling at its best. It is stunt work with a storyline. And much like you would go to a theater or a movies to be entertained, I do the same in wrestling. I love to be entertained. And so this is where it kind of, I didn't know. That's why I fell in love with the business. Yeah, the athleticism was great. Yes, seeing people and being inspired to become more healthy was great, but I think it was the storytelling that really grabbed my attention and still does to this day. So in 2002, I got into the business and you fast forward sometime, you know, a couple times in between. I was not wrestling for whatever reason, but it wasn't until about 2006 that I finally plunked down a large chunk of change and kind of like what I did with self publishing. I, I went all in. I flew up to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I trained underneath former WWE uh, superstar Lance Storm. And I was there for three months and wow. quite possibly the coldest, worst weather I've ever been in in my life. And of course, you know, Cal Calgarians, those Canadians up there in the Calgary area. How about that? We'll just go with that. <laughs> uh, they, they were like, oh, this is nothing. I'm like, this is nothing. It's negative 40 up here. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and uh, I, I trained and I, I got really, you know, into the business. And as soon as I came back to Ohio, I, like I said, it was kind of like self-publishing is to me. Then I said, you know what? I'm going to go all in on this. And for nearly actually over two years straight, I pushed my body to the max in the gym and also going out and wrestling every independent show I could. I didn't care if I didn't get paid sometimes. I would go to the show and I would bring my gear with me and I'd say, do you have a spot? And they'd say, yeah, we do, but we can't pay you anything. And I'd say, that's okay, just let me, give me a shot. I wanna go in the ring and I wanna show you what I have. And you know, you fast forward some time later in about 2008, blew out my back. And oh. that, that was it. That was the end. Uh, pretty much, it was the worst pain I've ever felt in my mm. life. I was on the chopping block for getting my second surgery ever on my back, and I didn't want to go through that. I, I literally, it was. It's a pain that that will will <laughs> will make a believer out of an atheist. We'll just put it that way. Right. You know, <laughs> it, it is pain that will just literally have you just, you know, I will, I literally, this was one of my, my phrases I would say to my doctor, I will eat glass if you told me that it would relieve the pain in my back. And so I had to reassess where I was going. I had to assess my life goals. And at that point I just decided, you know what? It, this isn't for me. This isn't right. something I'm going to be able to pursue. I can still be passionate and be in love with this business. And many people, you know, within the business were like, Hey, you should become a referee. Maybe you should be a manager. Maybe you should an announcer. And I did try, um, play by play. This is, this is fun. I never said this on a podcast before. I actually was a play by play, uh, commentary, uh, for a wrestling promotion out in Indiana, uh, for a little bit. I even came back very briefly for a cup of coffee, as I tell people, to do a few uh, wrestling gigs. 
And this was all the way from like 2010 to 2011. And then when I moved out to Arizona, that was the end of wrestling for me. Like yeah. literally I was like done, that's it, it's over. I just didn't want to do it anymore. But you know, I still keep ties with a lot of the guys in the business and it's something that has helped me out with my own discipline, understanding psychology of storytelling and really grabbing people's attention and commanding yeah. them. And, and the other thing is it also helped me talk better. That's, that's one of the things is as a person, and I think you understand this, as a content creator, you have to, in order to really keep an audience's attention, you have to communicate in a way that's compelling and can keep your audience coming back for more. And I think that's one thing that I really picked up and learned from the wrestling business. Excellent. When, when was the, the moment that you figured out that self-publishing was like a thing and that it was like a thing you could do? When I was employed, I had a corporate wellness coach that actually issued a challenge to me. And she felt that since I was so passionate about fitness, she wanted me to do a book. To me, I knew what self-publishing was and it always was kind of like that that thing that has like the stigma to it. Yeah. You know, your, your, your weird uncle from, you know, Colorado publishes books and he has an entire garage full of them and he wants you to kind of sell them for, for him. And <laughs> that's what I'd always kind of pictured. So I thought that I was going into this business that I was just going to go ahead and just, you know, maybe do like a hundred print books for myself and I'd hand them out to friends and family. So it really wasn't about making money at all for me when I got into this. But as I was getting further into this, I went into some local printers and I got some estimates and things like that. I was just like, oh man, I can't afford this. <laughs> like, I, you know, and I could afford it, but I couldn't justify the expense. Right. Nor could I bring myself to going to saying to family members like, hey, you should kick me 10 bucks and then we'll go ahead and I'll do this print run. It just didn't make sense to me. So I just kept investigating different print distributors online and I think Digipod was one of them. Once again, you just had to be saddled with the expenses of doing it all up front. You get a big old pallet full of books. I'm like, ah, I don't know. There's got to be an easier way. And then that's when I stumbled on CreateSpace, you know, the former yeah. CreateSpace. And that's when it was like, oh, wait, I can publish this and it's on Amazon? And that's when the whole new world was exposed to me. Yeah. That's when I saw, whoa, wait. I, Amazon's a pretty big deal because I order all my stuff through them. So if I've got my book on it, naturally millions of people can be able to reach my book. Light bulb goes off above my head. And I said, there has to be more to this. And yeah. That's where I kind of went down that little rabbit trail. Yeah. I think you already answered this a little bit, but uh, what's your favorite aspect of the business? My favorite aspect of the business. Oh gosh, there's so many, but I think, probably creatively expressing myself. I yeah. know this is coming from a nonfiction writer and it sounds kind of crazy. Like, oh, well, you're just, you know, spewing out facts, you know, right? Uh, no, not necessarily. I, I find that you still have to be very creative in order to write, yes. uh, be it nonfiction or fiction. So yes. I think it fulfills me to be creative and in any walk of life. I mean, even as a video content creator, I find that's a creative process for me. So that's yeah. the I would say if you were to put a gun to my head, that's the, the most important thing to me. How would you explain self-publishing to someone completely new who's just realizing it as an opportunity just in a few sentences? Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, if you're interested in writing and publishing books, and you would like to eventually land a traditional publishing deal, then self-publishing is for you. Excellent. <laughs> that was one sentence. It was that, a run-on one, but nonetheless, yeah. it was one. <laughs> yeah, that was good. I liked it. I liked it. I mean, I, it hit on all the, you know, if you like to write, if you're interested in doing a book, and if you, you know, want to go to the traditional route. Eventually, I think it pretty much covers the entire crowd. Yeah, I, I just kind of did that. That was improv. Good job. Good job. Thank you. So uh, why is self-publishing still viable going into 2019? Oh, wow. The technology is, is the reason. 
why self-publishing is where it is today. And this is why I'm such a huge proponent and an advocate for self-publishing and becoming an indie publisher because everything is so accessible. If you have the imagination and you have the resiliency and you have technology at your disposal, then self-publishing is huge and it's only yeah. going to get better. Yeah. And I'm gonna repeat that differently. It's gonna get better in the aspect that look at how accessible audiobooks are now. Yeah. I remember when I used to have to do audiobooks on freaking cassette tapes. Remember? They used yeah. to be these gigantic boxes full of like 12 of them. Yeah. And you'd have to peel through them. And every now and then I'd forget what tape I was on, you know, because I would put it back in. I'd be like, oh, which cassette tape? Oh, I listened to that chapter already. Yeah. Darn it. You know, and then there were CDs, but now downloadable audiobooks. And here's the cool thing is technology is getting so freaking amazing that you can record audiobooks. And I don't recommend you do this. And I know narrators across the country and all over the world are probably like, oh, we're going to go ahead and burn him at the stake. But people can actually <laughs> record audiobooks from their freaking iPhone. Yeah. Like you've got GarageBand right there. You can plug in a good microphone into your iPhone and record that. That right there just proves the accessibility of self-publishing today, and it's only going to get better. A lot of people yeah. want to use and throw around the saturation word. Ah, it's saturated. It's saturated. Ah, come on. Calm down. There are millions upon billions of people across the world. If you think that it's saturated, you're just fooling yourself. You're just giving yourself an excuse and a way out of, oh, this has never worked. I'm going to tell you that sometimes the most unlikeliest of people – have become super successful in this highly accessible business. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's going forward. It's only getting better. It's only getting better. And I think that with, you know, people like you, Ava, people like me, people like, um, you know, uh, Julie Broad of the Book Launcher, yeah. Rob Archangel of Archangel Link, I can drop all these names. All these people are at the forefront of something yeah. truly amazing. So what's made you stick with self-publishing when it seems like so many of the, the other entrepreneurs in our circle kind of only saw it as a stepping stone and they've kind of moved on to other things? What's made you stick with self-publishing? My love of literature. That's really what it comes down to. I, I love reading and yeah. I don't do enough of it, in my opinion, as of late. And I'm trying to work my priorities and my schedule around that a little bit more because it's something that also fulfills me that I'm able to sit down and open up a book and be completely enthralled with it for an hour at a time, two hours, yeah. three hours. Heck, I love seeing the entire day melt by just reading a good book. And that's why I find I'm very passionate about it. The others that have come and gone are those that you know, they're passionate about the income that it provides. Yeah. They're passionate about the vehicle that it is that they can leverage it and 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 hey that's awesome and I, I really truly believe that's great but to use it up and dispose it is completely i mean that is egregious on their part that they would yeah. ever do something like that because if they would just work this as a long-term business model yes it could be an ancillary portion of their business but it's still a very viable vehicle that could get your business expand and grow your brand. So yeah, it's I'm passionate about it because at the end of the day, it's about books and it's about reading. And as long as it's that, I'm going to continue to love it. Absolutely. Is there anything new coming from self-publishing with Dan in 2019? <laughs> self-publishing with or, Dan. I mean, Dell. <laughs> How often do we talk anyways, oh, Ava? I was joking. That one was oh, a joke. Oh, you, you're working me. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, all I see right now when it comes to self-publishing is the rise of audiobook. Downloadable audiobook, it's becoming huge. I've been trumpeting this for the past two years now, saying audiobook's getting bigger. It's getting bigger. A lot of people are starting to finally take notice the problem is they noticed that it's it's not as easy as you would make out to. That's that's why I said, you know, before with the iPhone answer, you know, if you know, people can record audiobooks, narrators are flipping out going, No, you can't, no, you can't. Well, 
it will get to the point that we can be able to refine that process and still be able to do that. So outside of that, I'd say downloadable audiobooks are becoming bigger. I think that when people understand the author brand isn't just simply about writing and publishing a book, that it's more about building a brand. Brand building is where it's going to be at. In the next five years, people are going to start to understand that they're not just an author. They are a brand. They yeah. are the person who communicates their message. And it's by way of what is their purpose? Who is their audience? And what do they need? And uh, so it's just only going to start to really get better. I'd say in the next five years, self-publishing is no longer going to be this weird, you know, uncle's garage full of dusty books that nobody wants to have. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree fully with that. You know, uh, with on the audio book up front, you know, I feel like if the music industry can ca- can have auto tune, we should be able to have something, you know, for narrators. <laughs> yes, auto tune. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, would you mind uh, name dropping a few resources that you use in your business that you just can't do without? Oh yeah. Uh... I'm going to say this right straight up front. Uh, some of these ones I'm going to say I have an affiliate relationship with. Yep. Um, but I don't accept affiliate relationships without, first of all, knowing what the product is, having used or tested the product, or use it on a regular basis. Now, these ones I'm going to mention, I have used a while. So Grammarly is going to be tip top at the very tip top of everything. Grammarly is the spelling and grammar checker. Now, a lot of people were like, whoa, can I just use Microsoft Word spelling and grammar checker? Actually, I use that too. I'll yeah. go and I'll peel through that one and I'll use Grammarly. But the nice thing about Grammarly is it actually goes into, if you're on social media, it will spell check, grammar check, all that stuff and get it to where everything's being put in line. And the nice thing is it starts to track your writing too. And it'll tell you how you're performing based on say, a global performance of other right. people that are in the, the uh, Grammarly app itself. Yeah, it sends and, you out that email every week. Yes, yes. I, lo- I love getting that because I'm like always like, yeah, I'm the top 1%, baby. I was more uh, productive than 98% of you idiots out there. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I, I love Grammarly. And, and you can either go free model or premium. I prefer premium just because it gets down to the nitty gritty based on the type of writing that you're doing. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm not so expensive. Well, well, it just depends on how you want to be perceived because here's the thing is you only get one chance to make that first impression. And I almost always, I would say, I like to think that every opportunity that I have to make a first impression, I try to make an impactful one And so I don't take it lightly that anytime I communicate, be it on a podcast like this or on a blog post, that I want to make sure that everything is tip top on shape and I'm communicating properly and I'm not having anything misconstrued. So yeah, Grammarly is huge. I would say the the next one in line, and I'm becoming so much more addicted to this darn thing than I should be, it's KDP Rocket. Dave Chesson's KDP Rocket is freaking amazing. Between the keyword research to the niche research categories, AMS keywords that it, it pulls together, and of course they have a new feature that's coming out that researches paperback as well. That's that's a game changer, and I just it saves me a lot of time. The keyword research that I would normally spend doing an hour to two hours, I can literally do within minutes on KDP Rocket. By the way, I haven't even I haven't even link dropped here for you folks. <laughs> so do it, and, you know. Uh, so, yeah, um, and, and let me give you one last, like the third one. This is going to be the weirdest resource. A lot of people are going to be like, whoa, YouTube. YouTube yeah. is an invaluable resource. I literally, I'll go on Google and I will search up something as simple as, I don't know, um, let me think here. For instance, when I first started doing a teleprompter, I actually made it with corkboard and duct tape. Oh yeah. <laughs> Corkboard and duct tape and a picture frame. And I did that by simply just getting on Google how to make a teleprompter. I looked at videos. I clicked on videos. YouTube, of course, the very first thing that pulled up and I will go look through on YouTube. Sometimes I'll just skip right to it and just go into YouTube and look it up. 
Um, I figured out how to do live streaming with the help with my brother, but more importantly, just looking things up on YouTube. And uh, so YouTube's probably one of my, I would say that if if I was pushed to have just one resource, it would always be YouTube because I can almost always solve all my problems through that. I find myself like referring my audience over and over, go look it up on YouTube, watch some YouTube videos here here's a YouTube video on that, you know, so it's really, uh, that resource I'd have to say, you know, somebody was like, Hey, Ava, Netflix or YouTube, I'd have to say YouTube because Agreed. You know, I, I can get entertained <laughs> and I can learn stuff with YouTube. And, yeah, it's and you just, can find out how to get Netflix for free on YouTube. <laughs> right. And it's just bottomless. Like there's no yeah. end to it. Yeah, 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 precisely. But uh, if anybody wants to get uh, their hands on those resources, once again, the my affiliate links are subpublishingwithdale.com slash Grammarly. And the other one, subpublishingwithdale.com slash KDP Rocket. And for YouTube, you just <laughs> YouTube.com. I don't have an affiliate for that. Right. You just go to it. <laughs> go there and watch a bunch of stuff on my channel. <laughs> yes, that's it. Precisely. Binge watch uh, the uh, Candid Cashflow podcast. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, are there any reasons that you would advise someone not to get into self-publishing, like based on something they said or, you know, where you would advise them maybe it's not the best route for them to take? If you're trying to get into it to make quick cash, this is the wrong business. Uh, you, If you want quick cash, go pick up a, a nine to five job. You're going to get something much more faster that's going to have, you know, immediate near instant gratification versus self-publishing. You're gonna see a lot of videos. You're gonna hear a lot of podcasts of these success stories. Don't get swept up in the hype. Don't start to believe, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. Because the bottom line, the bottom line is those are the rare people. Those are the rarities. Those are the unicorns of this business. The ones right. that go, well, I made $20,000 in my first 90 days of self-publishing. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's awesome for them. But I'm going to tell you that I have met literally thousands of aspiring authors and self-publishers who have barely made $500 in the course of a year. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. And some people are like, ah, that's a hyperbole. No, look it up. Find out what the average indie author makes per year it is absurdly low and this is hopefully to kind of put a reality to most people that come into this business if you think you're coming in for uh, get rich quick forget about it you need to find some other business that you're going to be able to get rich at yeah yeah so what's your take on the the whole no content low content phenomenon (laughs) i love how you call it a phenomenon uh you know, it's, I think that, you know, I've been playing around with that for the past couple of years now, actually, probably over the last year, I haven't really tooled around with it. Uh, I, it makes a significant income and to kind of explain it to some of your listeners and hopefully they're the interview with my wife, Kelly Publish. And if you haven't go back to Candid Cashflow, you're going to, you're going to listen to that. Take yeah. notes. But uh, no content book, low content books are essentially books that don't require the normal burden of having to write content, of yeah. writing a nonfiction book or a fiction book. It could be something as simple as a diary or notebook, or it could be a puzzle book, or it could be something as simple. Are you ready for this? This is considered low content picture books. A lot of yeah. people forget that picture books actually goes underneath no content because there's really no content outside of the actual pictures. So what my thoughts are about this is, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that get real excited about it. And again, it's just like any walk of self-publishing does not get rich quick. All right. There are some people that, man, they, they catch lightning in a bottle. But for the most part, I, I can't tell you how many times, Ava, I think you and I have had private conversations about this before to where there are people that will reach out to me and have like a thousand books. And they're like, I only made five dollars this month. I'm like, oh, my Lord, quit. Don't. Don't do any more. You're not doing it right. You know, that's that's the thing. You know, you can't force 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag. Folks, listen, you know, no content, low content books are all well and good, but it's like any other walk of publishing and be it writing or not writing. Yeah. It, it's it's going to take some time. It's going to take some work and it's going to take a little bit of creativity and a passion for this business for it to actually work. 
So yeah, no content and low content books are great. I kind of look at it as, as an ancil ancillary part of the business to where it's, it's a nice little extra revenue for me. I enjoyed when I was putting a lot of time into it. But if I was forced to, I would rather write a book than put out a no content book any day. Yeah. I know you consume a lot of YouTube. We just got done talking about that a little bit. So can you share with my listeners three channels that inspire you in your business over and over again? Mm. Nick Nimmin. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you know me all too, all too well. <laughs> I, I'm going to say, yeah, actually, at the very top of it would be Nick Nemen. And Nick actually has a YouTube channel based on pretty much making YouTube video content. And um, I am so incredibly proud of the guy. He's become a friend of mine and an indirect mentor. And, uh, you know, the guy's already over 300,000 freaking subscribers, and he grew that from less than 100,000 over a year ago to 300,000. That's nuts, right? So yeah. I, I like him and I like That's his crazy. style and his style is much like mine, that he just, he t-shirt, jeans, he's a regular guy and you know, he's crushing it on YouTube. You know, he's everything that he's doing is just turning to gold and it's amazing to see him do that. Yeah, Nick's one of my favorites. Hmm, Wrestle Talk. I, I literally, it is my addiction. <laughs> I don't go a day without watching a Wrestle Talk video. Um, it's, it's hosted by Ollie Davis uh, and uh, two other gentlemen. And it, it, they're funny. That's the thing is they, they, they are very passionate about the wrestling business and they share a lot of the gossip and, you know, and what <laughs> happened the night before and things like that. But it's also funny because they'll do gags and stunts. And believe it or not, if you look at my old thumbnails, and you compare them to Wrestle Talk. Literally, my video thumbnails are almost exactly like Wrestle Talk and how it was laid out to the font choice that I had. So yeah, Wrestle Talk would be the other one. And third, video content. Man, I would say currently, it, it's really a toss-up. I, I am. It's hard to keep me tied down to any one channel or have an allegiance to any one person. So. I'm just going to just kind of just say, typically it's just that third one, it varies one month to the next. Gotcha. So I'm going to say right now, book launchers. I'm going to lean on book <laughs> launchers. Julie Broad is such a sweetheart of a lady. She does yeah. a lot of shout outs for me. And she was one of the ones that was blazing the trail of self-publishing today. So there's my three, yeah. Nick Nemen, Russell Talk, and Julie Broad of book launchers, Excellent. aka book launchers. At what point would you advise publishers to consider uh, outsourcing, hiring a virtual assistant? Discretionary expense versus discretionary time. I heard this explained to me some time ago, and I can't remember who specifically said it. It might have been like Steve Reagan or someone like that. Yeah. But it, it all comes down to what do you have more of? If you're brand yeah. new to this business, I would recommend figuring out what you have more of. Do you have more time? Do you have more money? Yeah. And here's the deal. If you have a full-time job, you're a full-time dad or mom, you've got kids, you have a, you know, a bowling league, things like that, you probably don't have a lot of time. So you right. need to figure out what can, you, how, what can you do to hire out. And that's usually about the time. Now, if you've got more discretionary time, in other words, you're unemployed and you don't have much money at all, you're going to probably have to put together a lot of sweat equity. You should right. not hire an assistant if you don't have the discretionary expense. And one other metric I would say is you're ready to hire out in self-publishing if you have broke at least the four-figure mark per month. Yeah. So in other words, you're making $1,000 or more per month, then you can go ahead and start to hire out. But from there you need to determine what are you strongest at and what are you weakest at. So I am horrible about website development. I'm horrible about doing SEO for blog posts. I, I literally, there's some things that just, you know, podcasts goes way over my head. You know what I do? I hire out somebody. Her name's Ava Fails, of course. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I... I I figure out what I can afford. And typically, folks, this is just a general advice. If you broke $1,000 or more per month, take 10% of 
of your earnings over the course of at least three months, and you're gonna funnel it off to the side, that money is not yours. That is for someone you're gonna hire out to do the things you don't wanna do or don't have the knowledge to do. So if I hate writing ad copy, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna hire out a copywriter. Yeah. You know, if I can't stand formatting my interiors, I'm gonna hire out a typesetter or somebody who can do an interior formatting. So hopefully this helps out. What I would always recommend is don't write out the rip as soon as you make a thousand dollars. Like, oh, I'm going to start. I'm going to go hire Ava. Here we go. We're going to do this. <laughs> you know, that's all well and good. Go hire Ava. But I think Ava would rather have, and all other assistants, if you will, would rather it be consistent work than for you to just all of a sudden blast them with work and then it's like, ah, I don't have anything else for you. People like to have consistent, you know, work and yeah. it's something that they can come back to over and again. So I would just recommend budget wisely. And this is something I'm super guilty of. I'm very guilty of that I need to do a better job of actually budgeting out some of these things and, you know, doing it at the right time. Dale, you're so great. You plug me on your show. You come on my show. You plug me. I mean, you know, you probably plug me on other people's <laughs> shows. It's fantastic. I do. I do. There's lots of podcasts and video interviews I've had where I... <laughs> I have easily mentioned you at least a dozen times over the last year. <laughs> so tell the cash flow nation where they can find your stuff online. Super simple. And folks, take a, take a tip from me. Anytime you're on a podcast or you're in an interview of some sort, one place, one place, not 50 places, <laughs> selfpublishingwithdale.com. It literally has everything you're going to need. You can be able to see where I'm at in, in social media. You can see where I'm at in YouTube. You can even read content by me, and you can even reach out to me, sort of. Yes. Think so? <laughs> no. Never mind. Selfpublishingwithdale.com, all joking aside. <laughs> all righty. And finally, what is your number one tip for the cash flow nation? Man, this is always tough. Number one tip, do what you love and love what you do. Excellent. It's a good one. It's a, it's a really good one. You know, the show, we focus mainly on helping people learn about all the ways there are out there. You know, like you were talking about audiobooks earlier and just the opportunity that that is and how available all of this stuff is, the technology. And that's what basically what this show is all about is informing people of all those opportunities that are out there. And with an emphasis on turning your passion into cash flow. So taking whatever it is that you love and turning that into an income stream. So that definitely fits right along with what the what we're all about here. You, you, you got it right down. You nailed it for sure. <laughs> well, listen, I am. It has been such a privilege to have you on. I'm so happy that we managed to coordinate this, that I was able to call you the wrong name and, and all kinds of cool things. It's been great. <laughs> I hope y'all enjoyed this episode as much as I did making it. Dale is such a dear friend and all around nice guy. I urge you, if you're into self-publishing, to follow Dale, join his Facebook group, and meet the great community he's drawn to himself. It has changed my life. Look for the blooper reel from the Candy Cash Flow podcast over 2018 in the show notes at heyoava.com slash episode 53. Please consider subscribing to the Candy Cash Flow podcast because I have great plans for the coming year and I'd love for you to be a part of it. Find us in your favorite listening app by visiting heyoava.com slash Candid Cash Flow. Connect with the Cash Flow Nation on Facebook. Now is the time to join the group as a founding member and help us create a wonderful community that helps each other with tips and resources to get financially free at heyoava.com slash Facebook. To you and yours, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and blessed New Year. Remember, we release a new episode each Wednesday. Until next year, turning your passion into cash flow. Thank you.